some worship. Wow. I'm just telling you. I'm over there going for the Kleenexes. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Um, if the ushers are done with the offering, we have something that they need to pass out to you, and they're going to start passing it out. Uh, you know, the song talks about deep crying out to deep. And it really is talking about how as you, as you get to know Christ, there is a yearning inside of you that you want to be all that Christ has for you to be. There is, there is, there is a yearning and a desire that you become all that Christ has for you to be. And, uh, and the, the song about the chains and the breaking away of those things that have been holding you. This morning we're going to be talking about generous love as it has to do with parenting. And uh, there is nothing, I don't believe, more important than parenting. You see, you're not just accountable for you. You're accountable for all those children that are growing up. This morning we were looking at breaking chains. And I believe the Lord is going to break some chains in the area of parenting today. You may have the chain of modeling from past generations. And that somehow just keeps coming up inside of you. Um, the Lord wants to break that and enable you to be able to parent in the way that he wants to. We're passing out M&Ms this morning. <clears throat> what could break chains more than M&Ms? Uh, the reason we're passing them out is all of the points of the sermon are M's. Every point of the sermon is M. And, I, and you know, every pastor wants to know, do they really remember beyond Wednesday anything that you said? <clears throat> So you won't forget that you got M&Ms. And uh, if you can just make the connection between M and any one of the points this morning, I will consider it a success. You know, the only thing about doing something like this is you create a disruption in the whole service, right? <clears throat> but... Uh, I thought for M&M's it was worth it. <laughs> you know, sometimes you just got to count the cost before you, like, lunge into a battle. And uh, I, I prayed about it. I counted the cost. And I sent Marianne out to get 300 packs of M&M's. <clears throat> so this is M&M's Sunday. Wow, you've never had an M&M Sunday before, have you? This is it. This is it. I don't even think any megachurches I've ever heard of an M&M &M Sunday. <laughs> Maybe if you're watching and you're a pastor of an M&M uh, megachurch, um, consider M&M Sunday. <laughs> but if you had 5,000 packs of M&Ms to pass out, it might be too costly. So praise God, we're right where we're at, right? <clears throat> Anyways... Uh, you're welcome to open them and uh, eat an M&M &M on every, uh, every uh, time we get to a, a new point. And uh, you can cheat and eat them whenever you want to. You want to. Uh, the nice thing about everybody getting one is you don't hear the rumple of somebody opening a lifesaver next to you. <clears throat> and you're not able to get one, but you don't want to look irritated. You just want to be cool. All the things that go on in church. Like, I'm a churchy. I know all these things. Amen. Amen. Let's go to the Lord. I think we need to regroup. Lord, we praise you that you are the God of parenting. You, you are the God that teaches us how to parent. You are the God that has generous love for us. And you give us generous love that we can pour into our children. So today, Lord, as we look at your scriptures and we look at some concepts and we think about some things and we look at some funny photos and whatever, Lord, I pray that somehow the chains of bad parenting will be broken this morning. 
And Lord, we will not just see that as something that is not important, but it is one of the most important things that you've ever given us to do. And Lord, we pray for the, uh, the uh, grandparents also today. Lord, that they would be uh, struck by how important this new generation is. And they also would commit to great grandparenting. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You have the little cards in the bulletins that you can write down the, the points. And uh, they'll all start with M. So um, what does it take to be a great parent? What does it take to show generous love to your children? Um, I think the first thing that it takes is mandate. And mandate is really a way of saying rules. You have to set up mandates in the house. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 20 through 23 says, My son, keep your father's commands and do not forsake your mother's teachings. Bind them un upon your heart forever. Fasten them around your neck. When you walk, they will guide you. When you sleep, they will watch over you. When you're awake, they will speak to you. For these commands are a lamp. These teachings are a light. And the correction of discipline are the way of life. You know, it's, it's hard to make thoughtful rules. It's so easy to just kind of let it happen. And when the kids get too bad, you just fly off the handle and deal with it. You know, I uh, traveled a lot, and I traveled a lot when the kids were small, and, and I'd come home, and sometimes you're just so wound up from the job that it doesn't take much to, like, irritate you. But that's not what we're talking about. The M of mandates is that there is, there is some guidelines that are well thought out. It's hard to make thoughtful rules, but it's necessary. You see, if you have a puppy with no rules, it's a problem. <clears throat> and uh, I think the Lord gave me this puppy just to teach me, again, about parenting. It's hard. You know, it's funny when he chews on the uh, kitchen table. It kind of is funny, but it's not a good thing. You know, it's, it's kind of funny when he jumps up on everybody, but it's, it's not a good thing. There are, there are so many things that, that you just have to, if you want to be a good puppy owner, uh, you just, good puppy parent, is that, is that possible, a puppy parent? But you just have to, like, make some good, consistent rules. And it is, it is because you love the puppy. You want the puppy to be good. You, you, my puppy ran across the street and played with the dog across the street, but, but that's not good. There's cars going down the road. You need to set some rules. So we, got, we finally put the electric collar on him that we had for our previous dogs and put up the fences, and, and, and the, puppy, the puppy had to get shocked. You know, it's, it's like, it, it, I, I cringed my eyes as he went by there, and I said, Cole, don't go there, don't go there, and he went there, and that's it. But you have to have rules. Children cannot grow up without mandates. You have to have structure in the house, and I want to talk about some of those. You know, uh, rules communicate expectations. We expect things out of our children. But if we don't have guidelines, if we don't have consistent rules, if we don't parent, how are they ever going to meet up to our expectations? And then we're going to be disappointed and we're going to be like scrambling. I'm telling you, God says that there needs to be mandates, rules, and structures in the home. I want to talk about some of them that I found to be non-negotiables. Rules you have to have. And... Uh, in this family, I'm stating all the mandates in that line, in this family, and then I'm going to add something to it. In this family, we respect. Respect has to be a mandate in children's lives. 
1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 4 through 5 are the requirements for an elder or for a pastor. It says that he must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him with proper respect. You know, it, it's, it's not, it's not a, a bad thing. It's not, it's not something that is just dogmatically authoritarian. It, it is something we all have to learn. We have to ha learn how to be people of respect. We have to respect authority. We have to respect our teachers. We have to respect our parents. We have to have respect. And that's one of the non-negotiables. We, we can't raise children like Eli, the high priest, did. Do you remember the story of Eli? Eli was the high priest. Eli was there when Hannah came in and prayed for Samuel to be born. And Eli was the one who took Samuel into the temple and actually mentored him and taught him about. But Eli had sons. And these sons grew up in the temple and they had no respect. They would, they would take their position and they would, they would take the choices meat that was uh, offered for sacrifice and they would have a meal with it. They would also take women who were there in vulnerable positions and have sex with them. So the Lord says they have no respect. And the Lord allowed them to be killed in a battle. We don't want our children to end up in jail. We don't want our children to flunk out of school. So we have to start by teaching them respect as a mandate early in their lives. And, and it'll become something that will enable expectations to actually be fulfilled. In this family, we listen. Proverbs chapter 23, verses 19 through 21. Listen, my son, and be wise, and keep your heart on the right path. Do not join those who drink too much wine or gorge themselves with meat. For drunkards and gluttonous become poor, and drowsy clothing and drowsiness clothes them in rags. Solomon was saying in his proverb that my son, you have to learn to listen. And, 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 and listening is, is uh, not making somebody into something. It's just they have to listen. You don't always have to agree, but you have to listen and consider. You know, you might have a political position and you are communicating it to your children and they might go off to college and they might come back with some different political position. And you might have to sit down and, and, and the rule is we listen to each other. We listen. We don't have to agree, but we have to listen respectfully. We can't force our kids to be Christians. You know, it's a fallacy to think that you can just bring your kids from birth on to church, and they will, they will just become Christians. But if you have the mandate of listening and respect in the house, and then they will get to the point where they consider the claims of Christ. And I believe that when they consider the claims of Christ, they're going to choose Christ. But if they never learn how to listen, they're just going to let all of it just run off like water off a duck. And we've seen far too many kids grow up in this church that never got to the point of choosing Christ. In this house, we do our best at school. Luke chapter 2, verse 41. Every year, his parents, this is talking about Jesus, went to Jerusalem for the feast of Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the feast according to the custom. After the feast was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking 
for him among the relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to the Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and answering their questions. Where did they find Jesus? In school. They found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and answers. When the parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me? Didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and men. Jesus was a student. When, when the baby Jesus was born, he was God and man. But the God side of him was not revealed until he grew up as a man. So everything Jesus did as a, as a young man growing up was done as a man wanting to serve God. And one of the deep things in his heart was knowing that his father in heaven was someone who deserved his time studying and learning about. It's a mystery of how that all worked out with this God child growing up. But one of the things that I see from this is that schooling is very important. We have to be educated. And in our house, you have to do your best at school. You don't have to be an A student, but you have to do your best. My son probably tries the hardest to do his best. In fact, he goes to a program as an adult with special needs, and I checked his bag the other day, and he's still carrying books that were used in one of the young adult studies with him to, to uh, work with him, and he says, it's my library. And it was a John Bevere book about good or God, and I said, Andrew, what's that about? And he, he said, it's about being good. You see, you don't have to be the A student, but you have to be diligent. And in our house, you have to do your best. It's a mandate. It's the way we operate. It's the rule. It's the expectation. In our house, we go to church. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, let us not give up meeting together as the habit of some are doing, but let us encourage each other and all the more as the day is approaching. In our house, going to church isn't a question for Saturday night or Sunday morning. It's a mandate. We go to church. And I'm telling you, one of the keys to our success as parenting is that we brought the kids to church. We were church people because there's encouragement in the body. When my son Andrew was born, the encouragement that we received from this body was unbelievable. And the fact that he has done so well and is one of our most steady ushers, is that he grew up in the church environment where there was encouragement. There are other people that Andrew knows that are part of the different Special Olympic programs and things that we know that the kids have not done well. They, they fall into depression in their 30s. They don't go to church. They don't have a community of encouragement that is continual. I'm telling you, you need to go to church. 
and online people, I'm telling you, there's nothing like being in the service. You need to go to church. You get encouragement. You get your spirit lifted up. Aren't you so glad you were here for that worship this morning? We go to church in our family. We go to church. Um, you know, we go to church and it's not an option, but we get encouragement. You can't make a child into a Christian. But I'm telling you, if you raise them in the environment of church, they're most likely are going to have an option to choose Christ. And what went on in the youth group, that's just powerful. That's how God works. I remember as our teenagers uh, were, were, were going and growing, that was just the beginning of the Brownsville revival and the impact that that had in our kids. If they weren't in church, if they just came once in a while, would that ever have happened? Would Liz have gone to Brownsville? Would, he, would she have met Pastor Craig? Would they be here ministering? Would all of this be going on now if we didn't bring our kids to church? It's powerful. It's a mandate. It's a rule that we set in our house. Okay, if you have your M&Ms, it's time for the next M. <laughs> Model. Model. Generous love in modeling. You know, it takes, it takes a lot of work to, be a, to model for people. I mean, you, you, have to, you have to be on top of your game all the time. If you're going to say, follow me, I'm your model, it brings a sobriety to your actions. You can't just think about yourself anymore. You, you, you have to think about what God is calling you to do, who he's calling you to be. Who is looking at you? You know, one of the things that happens every Saturday at our house is we get up, we have like a routine, and we do some job around the house, and Andrew helps me with it. And, and uh, you know, if I get up and put a denim shirt on, He'll uh, check it out, put a denim shirt on. He'll get, he'll get on whatever is the proper clothes that I've determined for the task at hand. You see, you're a model. People are looking after you. People are going to raise their life based on what you do. It's not just you. It's another generation. And it's a generation after that. Who knows what impact you might be having in your modeling? You know, one of the chains that we need to break is the modeling of the past if you've had bad modeling. You can't just say, this is the way we do it and it did it in our family. This is the way my dad did it. You, 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 that may be true, but that's a chain that can be broken. Your father may have had a temper. Your father may have drank. Your father may have yelled. Your father may have abused. But there, there, is, a, there is a Lord. There is a Jesus. There is a Holy Spirit that can break that. There is a, a passage I want to read in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 14 through 17. I am not writing this to shame you, but to warn you, my dear children, even though you have 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. Can you say that to your children? Can you say to your child, I want you to imitate the way I'm living my life? Modeling. Do you want your children to follow your example? That's the first question. The second question is, what needs to change in your life that you will be ready to let them, let yourself be their model? We need to think about that. What things in my life need to change 
so that I would be happy to have the next generation model their life after me. God is a God of restoration. God is a God of redirection. God redirected the Apostle Paul from being someone who was murderous to being someone who could say, imitate me. He said in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. You see, that's, that's the example that we have to follow. Is how is Christ moving forward? How did God father? How is he doing things? And how can I be more like that in my life? You ready for your candy? It's time for the next M. <laughs> While you're eating, I'm going to take a drink. The next M is marriage. Marriage. Generous love in marriage means generous example for the kids. We repeat what we see. We've been talking about that already. We repeat what we see. Jesus says in um, Mark chapter 5, But in the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they will no longer be two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. A good marriage is good for the kids. But a good marriage is good for you, too. You know? Every marriage has, has struggles. Every marriage has two people that are imperfect living together. But every Christian who is married has a Lord. And that Lord said, for this reason a man shall leave his mother and father and join together. And what God has joined together, let no man separate. There is a, a creation that he did, but he's also forming you. He's also working on you. And the fitting together that he does is a work of, of coping and sanding and shaping so that you'll work together. You don't just get to be exactly like you are and have a good marriage. You have to, you have to begin to cope and shape to the other so that you are fitted together. When a stonemason gets a piece of rock and he's putting it into a wall, you, you want to have just the finest of joints between stones. And the only way you can do that is to take a chisel and a hammer and start chipping away at that stone until it fits the contour of the other stone. I believe that's what God is saying about marriage today. We have to be willing to allow him fitting us together. And there may be some misfit marriages here this morning, and you may be of, have children in the home or you may not. I'm telling you, it doesn't matter. God is saying that you need to allow him to fit you together so that your marriage will be more of an example of Christ in the church than it is now. The church should not be a place where bad marriages remain bad. A church should be the place where bad marriages work at becoming great marriages. And we do that because we allow God to spiritually change us. It's not going to just happen because we just say, okay, we're going to have a good marriage. We're going to have to work together to change and fit together. And God wants to do that. God wants to break chains of bad marriages today. Hallelujah. The Spirit is so real today. I was working on this uh, water feature at this church, and, and the pumps we put in to pump water up on the, on the face of the wall were, were uh, pumps that rusted. And so we took them apart and cleaned them, and we uh, put primer on them, and we put this uh, coal tar epoxy on them to make them not rust. And then we went to put them back together, and, and, and the one part wouldn't fit into the other part. It wouldn't fit into the other part until I took all of that stuff away and got it back to where it was supposed to be, and then it fit into the part. And I was just thinking about how God does that with us. 
We put all this stuff around us, all this stuff on us, and we want to fit into a relationship. And sometimes God has to just be there to cut that back. And so God may be doing some cutting this morning and some coping this morning and some sanding this morning. But I'm going to tell you that it might hurt why it's happening, but it'll be so much better when you're fit together. Praise the Lord. You got your candy handy? I want to move on. If you would eat another M&M. We're going to talk about the next M is mentoring. Mentoring. Generous love as a parent is mentoring. The definition of mentor is an experience and trusted advisor. It takes generous love to be a true mentor to the kids. It takes longevity. You have to outlive the strange phases of your children. You know, I, I could tell stories about the pastor's wife today, but I'm not going to. <clears throat> it, just, it just wouldn't be proper. But we have stories, we have photos, we have all kinds of stuff. You know, kids go through strange phases. And if you want to be a mentor, if you want to be the experienced, trusted advisor for your children, it takes longevity. You're going to have some storms. You're going to have some things that aren't quite the way they should be. You're going to say, what, you did that? Is that the way I raised you? You're going to think all those thoughts. But you're going to have to just say, I'm in it for the long haul. There is nothing that you can do that I won't be here to be your trusted advisor. There is nothing that's going to happen that's going to break our relationship. I'm, as far as it goes for my part, I'm going to remain longevity, your trusted advisor. It takes diligence. You know, it takes diligence, like modeling. It's similar to modeling. It takes diligence. If, you, if, you're not, if you're not constant, if you're not consistent, with one action, you can upset the trusted part of advisor. With one bad action. With one, one careless thing that you do that is not, is not thoughtful. One thing that you, one action that you have, one day that you spent, one night that you had, you could disrupt the whole thing. It takes diligence. It also takes authenticity. You can't fake being a mentor. You can't come in with flowerly talk and just hugging this and that and then just do all of that kind of stuff and not really stay there and be authentic. You know, authenticity means that sometimes when you do make a mistake, you fess up to the mistake and you clear it up as quick as possible because you're going to be authentic with them. You're not going to try to have a secret life or doing something on the side that you don't want them to know about. You're going to be authentic. That's how you're going to be a mentor. You can't break the trust. In Acts chapter 16, Paul takes on a position of a mentor with a young man he came to Deborah, and then he went to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was a Jewish and a believer, but whose father was Greek. The brothers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on a journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. And as they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. So the churches were strengthened in faith and grew daily in number. Paul here takes on a position of being a father, spiritual father and mentor to this young man who had a heart for God but never had a Christian father. And so Paul came in and became that mentor to him. And as they went, in, went along, the result of that mentorship relationship was 
the churches were strengthened in faith and grew daily in number. That's just a little phrase in this, but if you go on to the relationship between Paul and Timothy and the two books that Paul writes to Timothy, you, you see this young man who had his weaknesses, had his battles, but had this mentor who was pouring into him. And if we have that relationship with our children, we will be there when they need us. We will be there to show them the way. We will be there to guide them. In our family, Marianne has a tremendous mentoring relationship with her daughters. They always know when to call her. It's, 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 it's a relationship that has never been broken. There's been nothing done to upset it. There's been no actions that Marianne ever did that would in any way deter them from calling her and asking her the advice. She is truly experienced, trusted advisor. That was a little heavy. Do you got your candy? Uh, <clears throat> if you would like to eat another M&M, uh, we're on to the M, mercy. Mercy. James chapter 2, verses 12 through 13. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Zach, could you put up that photo? Could you take down the scripture? There. Can you read it? Yeah. Yeah. We're learning a lot about mercy. He's so innocent. Look at him. I took him out at 1130 last night. He did his business outside. I thought, wow, we're going to have good. I put him in the cage. This morning, the cage looked good. I took him out, and I saw his tail was a little dirty. I went in, and he had covered it up with a blanket. <laughs> and then he looked like that to me. <laughs> mercy triumphs over judgment. Parenting requires a lot of mercy. You have to have the mandates, and you have to be firm, and you have to have that in this family we do this statements. But there's going to be time that the mandates are going to be broken. And I'll tell you, if you have mandates without mercy, it will lead to rebellion. There has to be mercy. Mercy doesn't mean that you're fooled by the situation. Mercy doesn't mean that you are lazy in your responsibility as a parent. Mercy means that even though you can judge, you choose in this situation to act like God acted and have mercy. A spirit of mercy has always got to be in your parenting. I hear the rustle of candy wrappers. You want to have another M&M? Yeah, it's been a long time. We're going to go on to memories. Memories. Joshua chapter 4, verse 47. So Joshua called together the 12 men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and he said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each one of you is to take a stone on his shoulder according to the number of tribes of the Israelites to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord when it crossed the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan were cut off these stones are a memorial to the people of Israel together. In a family, it's so important to make memories. It, it's, it's so important. It, it's, it's like 
one of the most critical things that you can do is, is make memories. Uh, the Johnsons just went on a, went on a, uh, a week vacation down into Virginia, and, and uh, Liz posted that Virginia was good. It made memories again. And there was <coughs> one picture that she posted of uh, um, Caleb and Kelsey next to a statue of Thomas Jefferson when we had gone to, uh, uh, what's the name of the South? Monticello uh, the first time, and now they're like standing over Thomas Jefferson. It's pretty cool to see the two pictures. But they're memories. They show, they show that you place an importance on how they're going to remember their childhood. There are things that are so, so, uh, so much an adventure. The kids will be out of the house before you know it. The grandkids will be out of the house before I know it. Uh, I mean, have you seen how they've been growing? But, but it happens so fast. You have to take time. It's, it's so easy to be overwhelmed by the, the stresses of life, that this has to be done, that has to be done. But you have to take time to make memories. Growing up, we would always go to the family farm. The last two weeks of August, my mom would load us all up with all her peach canning jars and drive from Rochester down to Biglerville, which is near Gettysburg, and we would spend two weeks at the farm. And, and it had such an impact on us growing up. Just knowing that the vacation to the farm was coming. And then we would also go to family camp, and we would, we would camp and go to the tabernacle and all those kind of things and play in Lake Ontario and, and uh, run along the sand dunes that were up there. It's something that sticks in my mind. It's a memory. It was an adventure that I had. I remember being on the farm, hanging on the side of the tractor as my uncle would bale hay and just sitting there and sitting there and falling asleep and waking up still holding on. Thankfully, I didn't fall off the tractor under the wheel, but, but those memories are, those are, those are memories. I remember my mom peeling peaches and us grabbing peaches while they were all and her sisters sitting around canning peaches at, at peach harvest time. Those are memories. Um, so I have a little video I want to show you that is a, 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 a memorial, almost like stones to my family. Do we have the voice? And she grew up on a farm near Gettysburg in Biglerville, Pennsylvania. And uh, when they were taking uh, all the stuff out of the farm and getting ready to sell it, I went and picked up a bunch of things that had a lot of significance to me. <clears throat> There's a picture of my uncle's truck. He was a truck driver, my uncle Johnny. This is a uh, device for pulling um, plows with the mule my grandfather used to use on the farm. That was one of the blankets on the couch. Uh, that crate that says JBF was John Blair Frazier. That was my grandfather's name. And in the Musselman's refrigerated areas, they would let the local farmers store their apples. Uh, that's a window out of the chicken coop. There's an old board that was off the old barn. The Texaco truck is a toy that we always got to play with. That little suitcase is the suitcase my uncle used when he was over the road truck driving. And one of the most neat things is that fork. It looks like a pitchfork. It's got a couple things broken out of it, but it's actually a stone fork. And my grandfather did not own a farm, and he worked out near Altoona on the railroad, 
and he worked and saved money uh, and that fork was his uh, stone fork for working on the railroad and by using that fork he was able to save enough money to buy a farm that was the place that my mom grew up and then the place that holds so much memories for me and my brothers and my brother Todd who's here and my brother Tom and Terry. So I hope you enjoyed this tour of Fraser Hall. Whenever you come to my house, it's the stair that leads up to the office. And um, yeah, my grandfather was quite a guy. Uh, uh, you know, my mother is the youngest of, uh, I think, 10 children. And so grandpa was old, you know, when I got to know him. But uh, they slept upstairs, the men did, out in an open room. And grandpa slept on the other side. My uncle slept on this side. and. When we would go, we would sleep with my uncle or something in, in, the, in the same bed. And uh, I remember my grandpa coming to bed and getting beside the bed, kneeling down, and having his prayers for the family. And, uh, you know, those prayers are probably why I'm here. And those kind of memories fit into your life and become a part of the structure of your personality. So we as parents need to consciously work on developing opportunities for memories like that, that our children can have. A lot of the things that your children will have as memories, you will have forgotten. It meant nothing to you. But somehow it was something that clicked in them and was impactful and directed them. So as we are consistent in our actions, whatever it is that becomes the memory will be something that is positive if we keep living positively. Um, I like this verse, Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. Train a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. You know, another M that... I had put on my outline as I was sitting here, so you guys won't have it in the back, but it's uh, the M. Does anybody want to eat an M&M? <clears throat> is men. Bill was talking about it, and uh, M for men. You know, the I, I'm sure that the input of a man in a family has so much to do with outcome of children. Not that people can't follow Christ in growing up in homes that are single parent, but I'm telling you men, if you're a father, you have responsibility. You have the responsibility to not just be they're passively allowing whatever your wife wants to do spiritually to take place. But you have got to have the role of the spiritual head of your household. That doesn't mean that you have to be the best at studying. That doesn't mean you have to be the most vocal at praying. That doesn't mean that you have to be better than your wife in every spiritual discipline. But that does mean that God has appointed you to be the head of your household. And you can't take a laissez-faire attitude about it. You have, to, you have to step in and be that spiritual head of the household. That's the way God had it to be. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8, and they won't have this verse, so just kind of remember it. It says, I want men everywhere to lift up hands holy hands in prayer without anger or disputing. If you don't know how to be the right father, I'm telling you, if you follow this instruction, 
and you lift up your hands in an act of surrender to God, and you are diligent in prayer, he will empower you to be the man that you never thought you could be, to be the spiritual leader that you never thought you could be. We have one last M, so if you would take this one and then put the candy away. We don't hate candy in church anymore, you know. <laughs> we used to have rules about this. <clears throat> you had to sneak the candy. But now it's open in front of everybody. It's crazy. The last M is for Mary. I want to read about Jesus' mother, Mary. Luke chapter 1, verse 30. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and will give birth to a son, and you will give him his name, Jesus. He will be great. He will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, who is going to have a child in her old age, and she was said to be barren as in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be unto me as you have said. Then the angel left her. Mary and you are just alike. Just people trying to live their life for God. But those who are parents, God has put something into your life. Another life to be responsible for. It's a sobering task. And I can understand why people get afraid of it and wonder how could they possibly do this and they weren't expecting this and all sorts of things. But there is, there is a secret power to become a superhero parent. You want to like be a parent with a cape? My little granddaughter down in Florida, I FaceTimed her yesterday to see how the puppy was doing and then she goes, I'm a superhero. She put a cape on and started running around. But we want to have superhero parents here. Parents of legends. And, and, and the secret power to being a superhero parent like Mary was, was that the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. You see, we can't do it on our own strength. But when the Holy Spirit overshadows you, you become to make decisions that you never even considered were good, the right or whatever, but the Holy Spirit kind of overshadowed you. And they become the exact perfect decision for your family. You, you, you might not be able to have the strength to do this or to do that or to know how to do it, but the power of the Holy Spirit overshadows you. That means in front of you is the power of the Holy Spirit. It, it, is, it is an overshadowing. We were beginning to sense a bit of that this morning during worship, the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit. You may not know what that feels like or experience, and you may think it's just emotion, but, but it is when, the, I love the illustration of the horizon where the, the heavens meet the earth. It is those periods where the overshadowing begins to impact your life. And you begin to operate in a spirit that you know is not your capability, but somehow the things are happening right. This morning, we want to conclude by having all the parents that have children in your household still. I, I wonder if you would please just come to the front. We want to pray that the power of the Most High will overshadow you. You may have areas in your life where you don't match up, you don't meet up, you may have had arguments on the way to church, you may have all sorts of things going on, but I'm telling you that there is a God who wants to work in your family. There is a God who wants to make you a parent that you've never been before. There is a God who wants to overshadow you.
And so if you would come forward, by coming forward, you're saying, I want to be someone who is overshadowed by God. And if you're a grandparent raising children in the household, would you come too? We want to see God overshadow our weaknesses. Mary didn't have the ability to have a child. She was still a virgin. But there was an overshadowing Holy Spirit. There was an overshadowing God that was going to bring out something that was not able to happen. And if the prayer teams can come and begin to just uh, uh, lay hands on each one. And we are just going to believe that this is going to be a day when there are chains broken. There is overshadowing taking place. And we are going to be parents that are truly superhero parents. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Lord, we want what you want for us. Lord, we want to be parents beyond our capabilities. Lord, we want to be overshadowed by you. Lord, we don't want our weaknesses. We don't want our frailties anymore. We don't even want our bad decisions of the past to impact how we're parenting now. Lord, we pray for our kids, Lord. We pray for those kids who are downstairs this morning. Lord, would you impact them with your spirit, Lord. Lord, would you bring a revival in their hearts. Lord, would you bring an awakening to them. Praise your name, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah.